Summer. <laughs> and at the end of it, you can tell me if it's true or not, um, based on your own judgment. So after we graduated high school, uh, we were all looking for a job, right? Um, a part-time job before we go to college. And um, I, was <laughs> I was able to find a job at a grocery store, but a friend of mine couldn't find a job. So he went ahead and um, got a job at a zoo. Um, he didn't like the idea, but that was what was offered to him, so he didn't have an option but to take it. So um, he worked at the zoo for a little bit, and after that, the monkey died. But um, people loved the monkey, like they came there mostly for the monkey. And he was asked to wear a costume of a monkey and behave like a monkey. <laughs> so um, the first day he hated it. The second day he was like, all right, this is not too bad. I'm actually having fun with this. So one day he was having too much fun and he found himself in the lion's den, like in the tiger's cage and wasn't the monkeys. <laughs> And uh, he was like, oh, somebody help me. He started screaming because, but other people that are there are thinking that he's an actual monkey, but he knows that he wasn't a monkey. So he found himself in the, um, the lion's cage and he was shouting, somebody help me. So the lion was getting so much closer to him. He goes, somebody help me. He started shouting. And the lion got closer and said, if you don't be quiet, we'll all get fired, <laughs> meaning that the lion wasn't a real lion either. The lion was pretending just like him. But isn't that what happened? Like we look at other people and we think, yeah, they have it one way or the other. But um, <laughs> it's not really that case. Um, the title of my message today is Remember Your Creator. Let's go into the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 12, verse 1. It reads, Remember your creator in the days of your youth, before the days of trouble come, and the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. Usually when we're young, well, I am young, when I was a little younger, um, I've never thought about days of evil coming. It was usually, um, I can live my life how I want. I'm young, I'm not sick, I'm healthy. I can do what I want when I want. I don't owe an explanation to anybody. Like, you guys understand what I'm saying. I do what I want to do. Yeah, I'll live in my parents' house, but what? I mean, they don't have to know everything either, right? Um, and that was the understanding. But here we are told that remember your creator in the days of your youth before the days of trouble come. This means that the days of trouble will come. There will come a day where you're not as strong as you used to be or as intelligent as you used to be. And things are going to change. And when you get to the other side of that life and you go... I find no pleasure in this, meaning that everything was meaningless, everything you fought for, everything that you thought was more important wasn't really important. But um, this morning, I want this word to encourage us so that we'll not find ourselves at the end thinking that uh, all of this was for nothing. So why should we dedicate our lives or our youth to serving God? We have to first understand that uh, we were not created, we didn't create ourselves. Right, God created us in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. It is written, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them both. So we are created by God. We did not create ourselves. So we are dependent on God. Amen. He made us for his glory. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 7 says, everyone who is called by my name. Whom I have created for my glory, I have formed him. Yes, I've made him. So God made us for his glory. He made us to worship him. And it, um, the third reason why we should dedicate our youth to Christ is that his plan for us are better than any we can have for ourselves. Jeremiah 29, 11 say, I know the plans I think or the thoughts I think towards you. They're thoughts of good and not of evil. 
Um, many times we have our own dreams and our plans that we want to achieve, but God's plan is better than ours. What, what God knows about our future, we don't know about our present. Amen. Why serve God in our youth? I hear people um, often say uh, while I was growing up in school or around my friends that um, serving God is for old people. Like, that's, that's old. That's boring. Like, serve God. Like, we can do that later. But we have to remember that God is eternal, right? Whatever we do today, God will forgive us. He's eternal. He has all the time in the world, but we don't, right? We're limited. We're, limit, uh, we're limited, but he's not. And um, Jesus bought us with a precious blood. We no longer live for ourselves. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15 said, And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. So he died for us, so we no longer belong to ourselves. Um, let's say you purchased, I don't want to use an example of slave because that's um, to the extreme. You purchase a phone, for example, right? The phone is going to do what you ask it to do. Hello, Siri. What's my address? Hey, Siri, can you do this? Um, the phone does what you ask it to do. So we are bought by Christ. So we are to do what God asked of us or what we were created to do. If you buy a phone and the phone doesn't work, you can't call on the phone, then it's malfunctioning. Right? It's no longer um, doing its purpose, the purpose of which it was created. And we were created by him and for his glory and to serve him. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. State that for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared for him that we should walk in. So God has already prepared things for us to do. And um, it says that we are to serve him. When you go to a restaurant, what does the server do? The server do exactly what you ask of them. If I ask for soda, you better bring me my soda. And if I don't like it, I can return it to you and say, listen, that's not what I asked for you. Or if the cup is dirty, now, come on now, you, you got to do better. There's a lot of things going around, so you have to help me out here. So we are, we are created to serve God, and we are to do his work according to his purpose. And God gave us his best, so we ought to give him our best. We can give God our best when we're young because we have all the time in the world. Usually we think, I'm busy, I don't have time, but ask a married person with kids. They know what, I don't have timing. But as young adults, as youth, most things that we do is just what? Go to school, come back and go to church or go out with friends and stuff like that. We still have time to give God our very best. And we're young, we're, we're smart. And um, we can use our ideas to the advancement of the kingdom of God rather than using our talents that God has given us for the world. And at the end of our years, we find no pleasure in them. Amen. And um, with God, is there a time required, uh, uh, an age requirement? Do you have to be a certain age to serve God? Or do you have to meet a certain requirement for God to use you? And the answer is no. Um, I will give you two examples of um, young people that God has used in the Bible. Josiah, for example. Josiah was eight years old when he became king. Um, 2 King chapter 22, verse 1 to 4, says that he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and followed completely the ways of his father David, not turning away, right, not turning to the right or to the left. At eight years old, I don't know if I've done everything completely the way even my parents wants me to do, talk less of God. But it says here that, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and followed completely. That means without exception. Everything Josiah did was perfect according to God's plan. And if at eight years old Josiah was able to do this, then we can. Amen. By the help of the Holy Spirit, of course. And also David. The Bible doesn't tell us how old David was when he um, took down Goliath, that 
everybody else was scared of. Um, but he was a youth. Um, First Samuel chapter 17 says, He came against me with a sword and spear and javelin. But I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. The day the Lord will hand you over to me, I will strike you down and cut your head. Now, when David was speaking, he wasn't speaking because of his own powers. He knew the God he served. And he had faith in the God that delivered him all these years that there's nothing in front of me that my God cannot take down because he've had that encounter with God already. So God was able to use Josiah and David, and God is able to use us as well. Amen. But how can we serve as a youth? How can we serve in the house of God? Um, there, are, there are times that I've asked myself that question. Um, if I can give a little personal um, testimony. I was born and raised in a church all my life. I've not known anything else than um, Christ Jesus. Um, at three years old, I started singing. Um, well, I wasn't here. I was in Togo. And my church, it's a very big church. Pastor Patrick can testify of this. At three years old, I told my mom on my birthday, I want to sing and thank God. And um, I did. I have a picture of that. And I look at it, I'm like, <laughs> wow. Um, but sometimes that's not always the case for all of us. Some of us have given their life to Christ at the age where they're, they're, they're um, old already. Not old, but they're not that young. So, or they have not been introduced to Christ the way they ought to be introduced to. But even though I, I, um, I was raised in a church, there were times in my life where I felt like, I don't have a place in a way, like I don't know what to do, or um, I don't want to say my next point too early, or um, distractions that will come around. But I will give us a few ways that we can um, serve in the house of God. And also I want us to remember that we should work with what God gave us, right? Value your God-given gift. Um, oftentimes we look at other people and we feel like, well, what they're doing is more important than what I'm doing. But that shouldn't be the case in the house of God. Um, everybody has their part. One person is the arm, one person is the leg, one person is the eye, the ear, and so forth. But together we make a body, right? If you're walking and you see a leg just by itself on the side of the street, that's creepy. You're going to run for your life. You're not going to stay there and be like, oh, hey, leg what are you doing here you know so we are a body so whatever um, gift that God has given us we we bring it together to make a body if one person is standing alone they can't achieve much but if we all come together we can achieve a lot for the glory of God amen talent whatever talent God has given you what is it that you know that um, you have the desire to do like you just you can do it all day you don't you don't need anybody to pay you for. Um, we should pay attention to those things. Um, for David, for example, he played instrument. And he played it so well and he practiced and worked on it so much so that when um, King Saul had a problem, he was possessed with demon. David would come and play and the demons would leave him. Like, do you know the level of, right? So if, um, if we also take care of the talent that God has given us, then imagine the wonders God can use us to do, right? And also with our time, we serve God by serving God and serving other people. I know that we're in a busy, busy country or whatever, but one thing I believe is if you want to do something, you can do it. You will do it. You'll find a way around it. It doesn't matter what your schedule is. Uh, most of the time I'm busy is just an excuse that we use. Right? We're busy, but there's other things that aren't necessary. And we take time to do them. <laughs> I see you looking at me. <laughs> and also with our treasure. For where your treasure is, there your heart is. If your treasure is in the work of God, guess where your heart is? In the work of God because you love him. And also by our testimony. So David um, gave a testimony when Saul told him, you're just a young boy. What are you doing? You can't take down Goliath. 
Um, David, chap I mean, 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 36 to 37. I'm going to read that quickly. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, your servant has killed both lion and bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he had defied the army of the living God. So um, David here gave a testimony to um, Saul about what God has used him to do. Like he has killed a lion with his bare hand. Like who would do that? <laughs> who would do that with nothing else but his bare hand? So he gave a testimony of what God has used him to do. So if God has used me, right, to do this, then it's possible for him to um, give me, grant me the grace to take down Goliath. What are certain things that discourage us, young adults or the youth in the church or um, in our entourage, if I will say, um, from serving God? The biggest one is distractions. Nobody's saying anything to you, right? But in your own mind, I went to church today and the way she was looking at me, I don't know. Why she look at me like that when I was singing? Why was Blessing doing this today when I was singing? She usually doesn't act like that. But today I'm singing and she's acting all out. Um, distractions. What will people say? Um, and it happened to David. Um, in First cha um, Samuel chapter 17, verse 33, Saul said to David, You are not able to go against the Philistine to fight him, for you are a youth. And he, men of war, from his youth. So basically Saul was discouraging David from going against Goliath. He was telling him that this man you're going against is trained for this. Or, um, you know, that person in the choir, they've been singing for years. And um, you just started. So what are you going to do? You can't do that. Or um, the calling God has called you. Um, there are other people doing that already. We don't need more of you, so um, sit down and do something else. Pretty much that's what um, Saul was telling David, but did he listen to them? He didn't. What if he listened to them? Would we have a story of um, David fighting Goliath, or would the people be free? They wouldn't be free. Goliath will still be um, harassing them day and night. So we should not pay attention to distraction, um, and also guilt. So the enemy reminds us of the person we used to be, right? The enemy will constantly come. The, the moment you choose to serve God, like, you know what? Yes, I used to be this person. I admit it. But now I have taken the step to serve God. It's like, girl, <laughs> you know who you used to be. You know what you used to do. Um, but that's the, trip, the, tra um, the traps of the enemy because God doesn't even look at you in that lens. And also distraction, um, distraction as in expired friends, right? Friends from your past. Um, friends that used to do what you used to do with you. They can't come on this journey with you. I understand people say that um, God will use you to change your friends. Yeah, God will use you to change your friend if he sends you. Because some friends you hang around with them, you go back to where you were or two times worse. And we need to watch out um, for such things. Um, distraction in the form of things we see, things we watch, TV, our phones, um, and just, um, you know, distractions. There's so many, so many, so many, so many distractions that can um, cause us not to serve God and to look away from what God has called us to be. To be. But God wants you, in the midst of all of this, I want to remind you that the God that has created you wants you. He wants you to serve him. He wants you to come back. Like that prodigal son that came back to his father, the big brother was angry because <laughs> I've been with you all my life, father. Like I didn't ruin any of your inheritance. But my younger brother went away and blew everything. He came back and you now throwing him a party. That's the kind of God we are. Um, we have. That's the kind of God we have. He welcomes us no matter how far we've been, but we have to come back to him. There's a few things that I want us to remember. And I'll read it um, from my PowerPoint. 
because these are points that I want us to constantly remember, even if we don't get anything from the message itself. If you can write it down, it will help you um, to look over it day and night. Your only hope for the fulfillment of your deepest desire is to passionately pursue God. Dreams are the product of the design of God. He knows how to fulfill your dreams. Loving him is your job, but fulfilling your heart desires is his job. Don't get the role reverse. Um, Psalm chapter 37 verse 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. So if you, um, you delight yourself in the Lord, your heart desires will begin to align with his desire. So it's no longer what I want to do. It's, it's more of what does God wants me to do? What is it that he wants of me? And the second point is, have, um, you have incredible skills and ability to develop for the glory of God. Don't compare yourself to others. Um, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14, it says, neglect not the gift that is in you. Uh, most of the time, um, I'll give my own personal example again. Um, I do praise and worship, right? I sing. And um, people would tell me, oh my God, blessing, I saw you here. And I'm like, you saw me? What do you mean? Oh, I saw your video. And I'm like, what was I doing? Like, <laughs> I do a lot of things. And they're like, no, you were singing. It sounds so good. I'm like, no, it didn't. Um, we have the tendency to um, diminish the gift God has given us. Other people see it, but we're like, nah, that ain't for me. That's not for you, but you're already doing it. God has already put it in you. So I want to encourage us that whatever gift God has placed in your heart, it's yours to work on. Amen. And um, your gift will make ways for you. Believe that. Um, you can see a lot of, I want to say singers because there's a lot of them, their gift have made a way for them. Some people, you look at them, um, they're not like all that, to be honest, right? But the gift God has placed in them have made a way for them because they have worked on it. They didn't neglect it. Um, and the third point is that your only hope for real happiness is a real, private, personal relationship with Christ Jesus. And that starts with salvation. And salvation is not the end of it. The salvation is just the beginning. Um, but we ought to walk every day with God faithfully. And the scripture is Proverbs um, chapter 18, verse 24. There is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Um, you'll find yourself in situations sometimes where nobody can help you. Or you can't even tell anybody what is truly going on with you. But the Holy Spirit is there. And if you make him your friend, he'll be there to rescue you. The fourth point is your greatest enemy is impatience. Waiting is hard. I get it. But look at it differently. You aren't really waiting, you're preparing. Don't rush what God is doing in your life right now. Let him have his way in his time. Be willing to wait for God's best. The next point is your greatest assignment is preparation. Um, oftentimes we pretend that we already are where God wants us to be when we're really not. Um, and the last point is your greatest asset is godly authorities, advisors, and counselor. Even if some authorities have let you down, there is somebody in your life that God has placed in your life to help you make the right choices, to avoid wrong, and see clearly through the fog of youth. Now, I'll be the first person to tell you, if you're younger, you feel like all these people are old. They don't know what they're saying. I mean, they are old, um, but they are here to help us, to guide us, because they they are old, they've been here longer than we have. They've seen things that we've never seen, right? I can sit here and think that um, that flag is this size, but a person that is ahead of me will look at me and say, no, that's not the correct size. It's actually bigger than that. It looks smaller because you're so far away. And that is um, the role of our pastors, 
um, our youth leaders, um, not your friend, not your best friend, because um, that ain't no help, but your advisors um, will help you in the church. <laughs> yeah, sometimes best friends aren't, <laughs> they aren't help. Um, but the people in the church, they love you, huh? they love you. They really do love you. It doesn't seem like they do because they're harsh on you, but um, you have to remember that the person that reproach you the most is the one that loves you the most. They want the best for you. Um, yeah, and one of the best decisions you could ever make is to have a trusted godly authority. All right, this is the message that um, the Lord has given me to share with you all. But at this moment, we're going to pray. We're going to pray for everyone that um, have taken the decision because you can take the decision and it gets hard along the way and it's abandoned, right? Or anyone that um, wants to take the decision now to, to give their, their, their youth, all of it to God and have God lead them. So right now I'm going to pray and then after that, we're going to pray for our nation. We all know what is going on um, in the world. But 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 14 says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land what i love about this scripture is it doesn't say i might uh, maybe i will heal the land but he said i will meaning that if truly we humble ourselves and recognize that we are nothing without god and recognize that truly he is the creator of heaven and earth because i see now um leaders coming together to pray to this same god that has been rejected for many years but we're going to join our faith to theirs and to the many people that have that have walked faithfully with god in this land and we're going to plead for mercy we're going to ask god to forgive us because we recognize that we have truly walked in our own ways but we are now turning back to him so that he will hear us from heaven and forgive our sins and heal our land and the second prayer we'll pray is for peace. Luke chapter 14, 27 said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives you. And it commands us to not let our heart be troubled and not to be afraid. In this season, it's hard not to be afraid. But if God tells us not to be afraid, it means that there are things that are going to happen that will make us to be fearful. But he's commanding us not to be afraid because he has not given us the spirit of fear. So we're going to begin by praying for our youth and young adults. We are the church. We are the ones that God is counting on to, to take the mantle. Amen. Let us begin to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. Father God, we bless your name for such a moment. What a privilege it is, oh God, that you have given us. We bless your name. Father, we honor you in this moment. Father, I stand here as a young adult myself, oh God, and I use myself as a point of contact. Father, for every young adult in this church, for every youth in this church, oh God. Father, standing on the altar, oh God, that you have anointed, I pray and ask, oh God, that every young adult and every youth in this church, oh God, we have an encounter with you in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray that their will, oh God, disappear, that your will, Father, we overtake them in the name of Jesus. Father, I ask that you don't need their permission. Father, we are giving, I'm, 
I ask, oh God, that you will impose your will on us in the name of Jesus. Because, Father, most of the time we don't know what we want. We don't even know what is good for us. But, Father, you have created us. You said in your word that before we were formed in the womb of our mother, you knew us and you had plans for us, oh God. So, Father, I pray for every youth and young adults. Father, I pray for the spirit of discernment. Father, that you help us to walk in steadfast with you. That we will not lean on our own understanding, oh God, but we will walk according to the plan that you have outlined for us in the name of Jesus. I pray, Father, that whatever is going on in the world will not have effect on us. Father, help us to stand still, oh God, to proclaim your word. We ask, oh God, that you help us, oh God, to not try. To not try to be like the world. You've said to us that we are of the world we are in the world but we are not of it father help us to constantly remember these words that you have spoken to us that we will not be led astray in the name of jesus and father i pray for your nation i pray for your people i've come father in one accord with your people that have dedicated their lives to you the people that you oh god have created every single one of us Father, we recognize that in so many ways we have failed you. Father, in so many ways we have sinned against you, oh God. As a nation, as the world, oh God, as the people you have created. We have sinned against you. We ask, Father, that you have mercy and forgive us. Have mercy, Father, and forgive us. Remember the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ, on our behalf. We know, Father, that we do not deserve your mercy. We don't deserve it. But remember the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ, for us. And, Father, heal our land. We pray, Father, that you heal our land, Father, from the USA, oh God, up to the north, to the south. Father, the whole earth needs your healing at this moment. We ask, oh God, that you do what you do best in the name of Jesus. And Father, we pray for peace. Let your wind blow, oh God, on the earth. We ask for peace, Father, that surpasses all understanding. The peace that you alone gives, Father, not as the world giveth. Help your people, oh God, to stand still, to know that you are God. In the midst of the chaos, in the midst, oh God, of all this anxiety and the future, and the fear of the unknown, oh God. We ask that you grant us peace in this moment. Father, help the church, help us, oh God, to stand still and not act like the world. The world is looking up to us, oh God. Let your will be done in this nation, oh God. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.